Once again, taking your Bibles and turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The title of the message this morning is The Duty of Devoting Ourselves to God. The Duty of Devoting Ourselves to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul declared the assembly of baptized believers at Corinth to be the temple of God. It states there, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now I will tell you at the outset that there was a lot of scriptures involved with this message. Therefore I have wrote them down here. I will have some that you'll need to turn to. But um, just because of the length and the time allowed us, I will be reading them uh, from my notes. Here he makes known the physical body of the believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit. When purity of the church was threatened, Paul reminded them that they were the temples of the Holy Spirit. When pure purity of the life of the Christian was at stake, he declared the body of a believer to be the shrine of the Holy Spirit. So you have to understand that and keep that in your thoughts and minds daily. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. That is holy. You cannot sin spiritually because the Holy Spirit cannot sin. The Holy Spirit is in constant communication with God. He's in constant communication. When you pray, he takes your unworthy words and he makes them pliable to God's ears. So the words that you're speaking may not necessarily be the words that reach God's ear. The implication is there. The thought is there. The purity of your heart is there. And, but he takes that because God is holy. And only that is holy is going to re be received by God. So the whole man is the temple. The understanding and the heart are the innermost shrine and the body, the porch and outside of the structure. So consider that as part of what the temple is. We have the inside and we have the outside. The first point I'd like to make, and I only have three, uh, even though the little lengthy, but the assumption of the natural man, the assumption of the natural man, men by nature think, they are their own. By nature, they think they're their own. Worldly men employ their time and talents as they please. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He is out of God's way. This is a natural man wandering in the back roads of wickedness. Sin is born in us and natural to us. It's a natural thing for us to be sinners. It's just that's how we are. James chapter 1 and verse 14 says, But every man is tempted. When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now we read that last week. See, you can lust, but when you're drawn away and you perform that which you have lusted after, there's the sin. There's the sin. We can curve the lust if we put our minds to it. Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, Walking after their own lust. I believe the President of the United States is a scoffer. 
He's walking after his own lust. He thinks he's God in a sense to him. He's the king. They think themselves at liberty to do so. It's just, they don't give God a thought in the matter. It's just they're doing their own thing. Turn over to Psalm 12 and 4. The book of Psalms. Twelve four and it says, Who has said with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? And then if you turn to Jeremiah chapter twenty three. Jeremiah chapter twenty three. And verse 17, 23, 17. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord has said ye shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. So they're walking after their own lust, their own desire, their own heart. They are like Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Pharaoh did know the Lord. He didn't know any, who he was, and he therefore he was going to do his own thing, the desires of his own heart, his own lust, his own wants. Basically, what he was saying, I neither know Jehovah nor fear him. I stand in defiance of him. And that's what most people do that are un, that are still un, un, yeah, I can't get the word out. All those that aren't saved, the unregenerated, they still stand on that. I stand in defiance of him. Ignorance and contempt of God are at the bottom of all wickedness. The wicked hold God in contempt because he is not their God. No man is or can be his own. No matter how much they want to be, they can't. It's just like I told you a couple weeks ago about the church. Once you become a member of the Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, you're under its authority. There's no escaping that unless you go to another church of life, faith, and practice, or by death. The church is, you still are under the authority of the church. See, we may be free of any human yoke, but no man is independent of God. They want to be, but they aren't. Even natural religion teaches that a man belongs to his God, whoever it may be. Every Christian should know he is not his own. Turn over to 1 Corinthians there in chapter 7 and verse 23. Paul says there to the church at Corinth, you are bought with a price. Be not ye servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Then look at Romans chapter 14. And verse 7 and 8. Romans 14 and verse 7 and 8. For none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, 
We are the Lord's. He bought us with a price. This is the saved person. This is the, the member of the church that has confessed Jesus Christ. You're not your own anymore. He bought you. He purchased you. You are his. And he's, you step out of line and he's going to correct that. Paul questions in a direct appeal to their conscience. He takes it for granted they were not ignorant of this truth. You knew it. You're not ignorant of it. He expresses surprise that such a truth could be forgotten. Once you've had the truth, then you should continue to know the truth. But those who walk away from the truth are the ones that are going to pay the price. The ultimate price. The second point is why we are not our own. So we're not our own. We understand that. But why is it that we're not our own? Well, certain things let us know that we're not our own. First of all, the presentation. In eternity past, we were given by God the Father to God the Son. Now understand how far back it was, okay? An eternity past. In John 17, 6, it says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. When did God do this? Before the foundation of the world. And then, when Christ came on the scene and was going to the cross, these are the ones that God gave him to die for. Jesus Christ is God's love gift to the believer. John 3, 16, we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Talking about his people. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. The elect are the Father's love gift to Jesus Christ. Turn over to the, the Gospel of John in verse 17, or chapter 17. The Gospel of John 17 in verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now, that's not saying every single human being that ever lived. It's the ones that God gave to Christ to do with. Then in verse 9, I pray for them. And he makes it very clear. I pray not for the world. I'm not praying for these ones that are condemned. They're condemned already. I'm not praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. You can't escape that. And anybody that thinks just because they're, they're a human being that they're going to die and go to heaven, that's not so. Only those that God chose, elected, predestinated, gave to Christ to die for are the ones that will be there. Why are we not our own? Because of creation. As our creator, he has unalienable rights over us. He owns us. Can't get around that. Psalm 100 and verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And Ecclesiastes 12, 1 says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Then turning to Acts, once again, chapter 17. Acts 17 and verse 25. He 
He says there in Acts 17 and verse 25, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And then look at verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We possess not a faculty of body or mind, but from God. In other words, we can't walk, we can't smell, we can't hear, none of those things. You can't see. God gave us the ability through the Lord Jesus Christ to do all these things. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didn't not receive? Now, if thou didn't receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Then 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is, our, is of God. Our sufficiency is of God. Everything that we have, everything that we do, comes from God. Why are we not our own? Because of the purchase that was made. 1 Corinthians 6.20. <clears throat> there in our text. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to him. We are the bought property of Christ. Bought all together for his ends. Not for ourselves, but for his end. Everything that God did was for him. It's for his honor and glory. So we should feel privileged this morning to be chosen of God because he did it for his glory and honor. Why are we saved? Have you ever asked that question? Why me, Lord? Why have I ever been? Because it was God's choice. It was God's decision to do so. The price, what was the price for this purchase? The price is the blood of Christ. Acts 20 and verse 28 Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. See, he didn't just purchase you on the cross of Calvary. He purchased the church as well. The whole church. Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's why we don't need the, the blood of bulls and goats anymore, because they will not cover that sin. God says, I need a perfect sacrifice. Christ said, I'll go. And that's what he did. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold... From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, blemish and without spot. Now, when Brother Ray was taking us through the, the tabernacle and temple and how everything was being sacrificed, if you go into Leviticus and see how the Leviticus priest, how they were supposed to do everything, they don't have to do that anymore, except the Jews are working on doing it again. Go in there when your next time you're at your computer, get on the internet or your phone or whatever, and look up the red heifer and just start to look through that. The Jews are right now are practicing. They have a mock temple set up 
And they are practicing how to make the sacrifice. And as soon as that red heifer is pure, 100% red, there can't be a white hair, black hair, or anything out of place. It has to be perfect. They're going to sacrifice that burnt heifer and use the ashes. And when that happens, well, we won't be here, but, but see, they're still practicing. They're still doing this. They're teaching it. This is what's going to happen. But Christ is out of the picture. See, because they're still doing the sacrifices of bulls and goats. Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's what Christ did. Christ bought us to be his eternal possession. When a man bought a slave, the slave belonged to him. We are redeemed for the Redeemer. We belong to Christ. And we are obligated to vote ourselves unreservedly to Christ. There should be no reservation in our day-to-day -day walk with Christ whether or not we should walk with him. We should have no reservation in there at all. We must not be defiled or alienated from Christ. Your heart and thoughts are Christ. Your abilities and influence is to be cons consecrated to Christ. Everything you have, everything you own, everything you are, everything that you possess, everything that, you know, we think of those who can't see. You have the ability to see. Some people don't have the ability to see. But even in that, their abilities and their influence is to be consecrated to Christ. Christ claims your all. Why are you not your own? Because of possession. We are not only purchased by him, but we are already possessed by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Paul wanted to make that very clear to the Corinthian church. You can't claim anything because you're not even yours. There are some things unlawful to a Christian. The temple of the Holy Spirit must be kept holy, fit for the master's use. And he's not going to use you if you're not doing what you should be. Think about that a minute. Well, I don't understand why things are happening. I don't understand why Christ isn't using me. I don't understand why things aren't going a little bit better. Well, maybe because you've done some things unlawful as a Christian. And when it's been brought to your attention, you continue to do these things that are unlawful as a Christian. I've always been a firm believer Almost from the time I was in the Baptist church for the very first time, I understood that when we have been taught, when we have been warned, when we have been showed in Scripture our duty as a Christian and we fail to do that, you can expect things to go wrong. That's just the way it's going to be. God is not going to use you. He will not use you in any shape or form until you give yourself your all to him. I mean your all. Not part of you. And if you remain in that sin, I think he'll take you out. I've always been a firm believer of that. He's not going to let you trample 
his son's blood under your feet. If you continue to be a poor witness for Jesus Christ and not do the, what you're supposed to do, then he's, not, he's done with you. He will no longer use you. And he's not going to let you remain here and continue to do that. So if you remain in the sin, be careful. Because you may not be here long. You may say, oh, well, that's great. I'm going to go to heaven early then. Oh, yeah, but don't forget you've got to stand before Christ. Well, forget about that. See, people forget, well, I'm going to heaven. Well, yeah, that's a good thing. But the day's coming when you have to stand before Christ. Go in there and read that. Brother Ray brought that out last week or two weeks ago. Why are we not our own? Because of preservation. Sometimes we get very sick and the Lord raises us up. And lengthens our days. Surely it is that we may use our remaining days as especially sacred serving him. I mean, that's what should be our desire. That should be our goal. We want to have our remaining days, however long they are, to serve him. I've always been puzzled. And I, I don't believe it's because of sin. I just believe that they done their duty. Baptist preachers that have gone before us, that are gone, that's been gone for years. Taken at a young age, and I mean young age, I mean in their 60s and 70s. I think that's in their young age. Why were they taken? God was done. They did exactly what he wanted them to do, and it come to a point. And I'm glad they're gone in a way. I mean, I miss them, but I'm glad they're gone away because I would not want them to see what has transpired in our life. And I'm sure they didn't want to see it either. So they have been spared. Those who have been gone before us have been spared of the wickedness of this world that they have preached for so long against has come to realization. Last point. The exhortation founded upon this fact. The exhortation found upon this fact. Our body and spirit are entirely God's property. That's why you do what he says. And you're not your own. We are bound to glorify him with both to the uttermost, as far as we can take it. And I know we fail. I fail. I fail miserably every day. And I know you fail miserably every day. But that's no excuse. See, it's no excuse. We stop. We repent. We fall down. We pick ourselves up and we brush ourselves off and full steam ahead. We cannot add anything to God's glory. Psalm 16, 3 says, But to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent to whom is all my delight. We are a delight to God. Nevertheless, God esteems himself glorified by our services. Psalm 50, 23, Whoso Offereth praise, glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. 1 Corinthians 10 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all for the glory of God. There are many ways to glorify God daily. I just wish God, some of God's people would get it through their heads. Today is his day. Because I know many, many, when, even in my early ministry, and I'm sure Brother Ray experienced the, the same thing in his early ministry, and every Baptist preacher has, has experienced in his ministry, that people will use the Lord's day for everything else except for the Lord. And if you pin them down, 
Family, children, all come first. We, giving up our bodies to him, is our reasonable service. And Paul said so in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Not something out of the ordinary. God's not asking us to do something that's out of the ordinary or something we can't do. Paul's saying it is our reasonable service. The doors open on Sunday morning. Service starts at 10 o'clock. It's your reasonable service to be here. Anything else is unacceptable to God. You may try to get by, but you're going to live in misery the rest of your days. You're going to be in misery because you're not attending the church house on a regular basis. I remember Brother Meek I think he tried to pound it in the, in the heads of his, in his members. When that door's open, you're to be here. Unless you're homesick in bed where you can't walk. When that door's open, you are to be here. And I concur. In the Old Testament, the fire fell on the sacrifices. Yield him all the members of your body. Romans 6, 13. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instrument of righteousness unto God. Let him have every faculty of your soul. Now ask yourself the question, are you doing that? Is God getting every faculty of your soul? Is he giving everything that you possibly can give? Psalm 103 and verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that in where is where within me, bless his holy name. The psalmist there says, everything that's in me, my, every fiber of my soul, I use to bless the Lord. Acts 27, 23, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Paul wrote those words. Let us be like Joshua. Now, <clears throat> Brother Lonnie has been going to try to, I'm sure he's going to get here at one point. Joshua 24, 15, you all know what it is. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. You have a choice to make. Who are you going to serve? Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, and we know what them days were like, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In conclusion to this, the slave of Christ cannot remain a slave of sin. Not even a slave to the opinions of men or the, to earthly standards. I was just talking to somebody I think yesterday or the day before. You cannot claim to be a homosexual and, a sa and, and have God as your Savior, as Jesus as your Savior. You cannot claim that. You can't. There's no possible way. If you're practicing sin, you are not a Christian. You are not one of God's and you are not purchased on the cross of Calvary. Nor can you be until you are brought out of that and filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot be a homosexual and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't care what they say. And these churches, I just seen 
I think Brother Gordon brought it out to me a couple weeks ago. The Methodist Church is going to start to embrace all of them. All of them. Shame on them. But that's not surprising. They do everything else under the sun that's weird. They can stand right here and say, oh yeah, but I'm saved. Oh no, but you're not. Because you cannot, as a Christian, live in that kind of sin. And it is sin. Again, I've been going through Leviticus. Go in here and read Leviticus. God comes down hard on this. It's abomination to him, and you're not going to get nothing worse than that coming from God. So, the slave of Christ cannot remain a slave of sin, not even a slave to the opinions of men or to earthly standards. So if the Methodist church wants to take on the opinion that it's okay, guess what, guys? You're wrong. It's sin. I don't care what color you paint it. The problem we have today in our society, in our religion, they don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about hell. They don't want no fire and brimstone preachers absolutely hate it. So what's that tell us? They hate Christ. And all he stands for, we must glorify God inwardly and outwardly. All is to be laid on the altar for Christ. And who's the altar? It's Christ. Christ is our altar. Let us beg God's forgiveness for our failures to glorify him in body and in spirit. Turn over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36 and 31. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 31. Look what he says here. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall <clears throat> loaf, which means hate, yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. That's what we need to do. We need to hate that. How responsible and delightful is Christian duty? Look at Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611, thou wilt show me the path of life and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You know who's at the right hand of God? Jesus Christ. If we honor God now, we shall have a crown hereafter. Not my own, my time, my talents, freely all to Christ I bring to be used in joyful service for the glory of my King. May God bless his word in your heart today.